Our next session is one that you do not want to miss. Former Congressman Patrick Kennedy is sitting down with pop culture expert and talk show host Andy Cohen. Andy Cohen is an Emmy Award winning host, producer and author best known as the host and executive producer of the Emmy nominated Watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen, Bravo's late night interactive talk show. He also serves as executive producer of the Real Housewives franchise and hosts the network's highly rated reunion specials. Join Andy and Patrick as they explore the intersection of pop culture, celebrity status, and our roles in advocacy. Patrick, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Jim, for uh, being our host and for all of your participation with all the panelists and the great dialogue that's taken place so far. Uh, now it's my opportunity and uh, real honor to introduce uh, Andy Cohen. Uh, Andy, welcome. I appreciate your being here. Great to see you. Thank you so much. Uh, we talked earlier about running into each other at the uh, train station in Washington. I noticed who you were because now that I'm out of politics, I don't get my news primarily from uh, C-SPAN and CNN anymore. Well, I hope you're not getting your news from me, but I appreciate the recognition. <laughs> well, you know, um, my wife and I often will watch the Bravo late at night and uh, uh, obviously, I recognized you, which I guess is a sign that uh, I, I am getting a new life af after politics. Really appreciate you being on. And so uh, let's just jump in. I mean, uh, you know, I'm in politics, so, you know, we react to public pressure in a, in a perfect world. And uh, political pressure is really generated by, you know, public attitudes and, of course, public attitudes by our culture. So we're at a really important time to have a conversation about stigma, shame against people with mental illness and addiction. And as someone who's kind of in the middle of the changing world that we're living in, I was really excited that you could come on and kind of give us your perspective on, on what you're seeing on, on so many levels as it comes to a culture change that we're undergoing right now. Feels like, thank you. I mean, it really feels like we're, there's we're at a fork in the road in terms of how we view uh, so much of what we're talking about here uh, from mental health issues to uh, racial issues to, uh, you know, just inclusion of uh, minorities uh, in the culture at large. And I think that, you know, I, I think if we were talking about mental health a little bit, to me, it's fascinating how the views of Britney Spears have changed just over the last year and really as a result of that documentary that the New York Times put out and um, kind of got swept up into a larger conversation of where we're at in terms of how we view people who are struggling with mental health. I think that, I mean, even a few years ago, it was perfectly acceptable to refer to someone as crazy, crazy in a um, public forum in a very casual way. And I think now, you know, you, you look at that word or other words like it and, and there's, a, um, there's an empathy about what people are going through in their own lives that I don't think really existed uh, a few years ago even as recently. And I think if you look at Britney Spears and the conservatorship, I think people weren't necessarily paying attention to it and weren't giving her the grace. Uh, because I think a lot of this is about giving someone the grace and the space to say, you might be going through something that I don't understand or I am not you know, familiar with or may seem funny to me or may seem like something that um, you know, I could be casual about, but if we, you know, we're, we're looking at people in a different way now. And, and I just think the Britney Spears thing is just a really interesting example of people now looking at, wow, this is a woman who, you know, maybe wasn't treated that well in the media. And if you look at the jokes people made about her publicly and, you know, what is she actually going through and what is this experience? And, how can we maybe look at her with a little more empathy than we have in the past? So um, anyway, that's just a broad rambling, but I do think we're at a, at, a, at a fork in the road. 
And it's a really interesting time right now. And I think it's, it's a positive time uh, in a lot of ways. But listen, you're from Washington. I think that the, the dialogue that was acceptable or considered acceptable uh, during the previous administration was really upsetting. I mean, you know, you, you, it, was a, it was a dialogue of name calling and of making fun of people and just of schoolyard antics. So there were there are kind of two different there are two different things going on in this country right now, and one is kind of a, an understanding and a sensitivity, and the other is a, you know a culture of name calling. So hopefully, the sensitivity will will prevail. Yeah, um, well, that's even more of a reason for people to not take for granted that things are going to go in the right direction, that it's up to them to kind of be more involved because look what happens when it's our default position. Our default position is to be in a reactive mode, yep. you know, and that's true of the individual. Like we live a lot of our lives kind of constantly reacting to frankly past traumas and past ways of thinking that keep a lot of us kind of, locked on that treadmill without any insight as to what is going on in front of us because we're in constant reactive mode. And of course, that guy that you were talking about in the White House last time, he knew how to tap into fear and he knew how to tap into insecurity. And uh, of course, he unlocked that. Mm. But in a real sense, we, you know, a lot of us are locked into that default mode. If we're not struggling to kind of be more mindful and have greater appreciation of the people around us and how our actions affect others. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate what you said about uh, Brittany. My mom uh, was also not only just in conservatorship, she was in a guardianship. My brother and sister, I had to go to court. Um, she'd had uh, three near fatal incidents in one year because of her alcoholism. And uh, we knew it wasn't gonna be long before she died if we didn't get in there and intervene. And uh, thank God we did because um, she's alive today. She plays with my kids. Uh, she's wow. the only one in my family and my, my parents still alive. So my kids get to see her. And uh, that would not have been the case had we not used that uh, intervention. As, as draconian as some people think it is, I just will tell you, the more draconian measure is her getting locked up in the right criminal justice system. And I think that's the debate. We don't want so many people locked up in our uh, incarcerated in our country. Unfortunately, a lot of them are incarcerated because they're untreated mental illness and untreated addiction. And maybe guardianship and conservatorship may be, uh, it may be bad in some people's view, but it's, it's got to be a lot better than the alternative. Uh, because unfortunately, I think, bigger, I, I think that the, the bigger thing is just to maybe have more empathy. I think as a culture for us all just to have more empathy about the struggle that each person is going through. And I think, you know, they're all case by case basis, but I, you know, if we can rip away the judgment and the yep. stereotype and the, you know, assumptions about who this person is or what they're going through and just kind of take a step back and say, okay, well, let me just recognize that maybe this is something that I don't understand, but I want to give them grace. Yeah. And so that's, I think, important. Yeah. So I, I, I love that. Um, you know, for the uh, early movement in the gay rights community, you know, there was that phrase during the AIDS uh, fights, um, silence equals death. Yep. And it wasn't until we really got the ACT UP community who are like at the point of the spear, the most, you know, revolutionary within the LGBTQ community that forced people to change public policy. And thank God they did. We got combination therapies for HIV AIDS to turn from a fatal illness to a chronic illness. You know, we made great progress. Ultimately, gay marriage and we had to we got rid of uh, defense of marriage act mm -hmm. but i kind of tell us a little bit about where you think it's that same fight against bigotry 
that that people today are kind of struggling to get free from, which frankly keeps a lot of people with mental illness and addiction also closeted, right? Also in the shadows of shame. I think you can't underestimate the importance of pop culture as it relates to uh, you know, changing the way people look at this and, and changing the way people look at, you know, their acceptance of gay people, certainly. Um, and, you know, I'm interviewing Lil Nas X today. Do you know who he is, Patrick? Yeah. Okay. So I, I just think this kid is like 22 or something. What he has done for an entire generation of specifically um, I think people of color, the way they're looking at um, at at LGB at the LGBTQ community, I can't underestimate the importance of him as a cultural shapeshifter. And so, um, I think pop culture plays a really big, you know, part in that. And um, and and I'm very grateful to be living in this time. I mean, when I, you know, it was. Sir, I'm 53, so my what I've seen happen, the ev evolution of how people have responded to gay people from the government to the playground has been an incredible, it's been an incredible movement. And I think it's all heading in the right direction. No, it's uh, very, very exciting. And in spite of the fact that we're living in very turbulent times all around and the trauma and stress that people are feeling is is unparalleled in my view yeah. um talk a little bit about your impressions of how young people today are are facing things differently than we did growing up and so far as they grew up in a, a world where technology is ubiquitous and you know that may have taken away time from the same type of uh playgrounds like you said or going off and hanging out you know, outside and doing all that stuff, which I think maybe uh, our young people have a tougher time finding time to do. Well, I think, you know, true. And I, I think that the young people today have a voice in the way that we never did. And I think social media is probably, you know, largely responsible for that. They're being listened to, they're being heard, they're being catered to in a way that can seem annoying, frankly. Uh, sometimes and uh you know you kind of want to say like when i was your age <laughs> blah, blah, blah. but um we have to listen to them and I, I just think they're they're being taught that their voice matters in a way and that they have the power to say no to things or to speak up against things and i and i think as a result this is a generation that will actually um, especially given, you know, the, can I cuss on this? <laughs> given, given the, the plate of poo poo that they're being handed in terms of a lot of things that are going around. I think this is a generation that's actually going to impact change in a way that we haven't seen since maybe, you know, the sixties. Yeah, I'm sorry we can't cuss on this. My That's brother, all right. I got my gave, point across. Yeah, my brother gave me a book, All the Ways to Use the F Word, after I dropped the F bomb at one of my public speeches uh, when I was in the office, and it got a lot of backlash. And it was uh, how to use the F word as a noun, as a verb, as an adjective, <laughs> as an adverb. It was it was perfect. Um, well, anyway, let me just jump into that whole point because I think that you know now as we're going back to work uh, employers are like struggling to figure out how they're going to get employees to sign up with them and how they're going to keep those employees yeah and to your point young people today are setting a whole new standard of what the workplace is going to look like because yeah. they're demanding you know a different work environment I know. And, you know, I think COVID has really uh, accelerated that because there's a whole generation of people that doesn't see the value in going into an office and they're, you know, I'm just, I'm going to do my thing and I'm going to stay here. And I, listen, I'm a, I'm a bit of an analog guy. And I think getting people together in the same room, is very important. I think it, it, 
it, you know, we may, this COVID thing may have really just changed things forever in our society in ways that may have happened, you know, down the line, but it just really accelerated it. And I don't know that it's for the better in my mind, but again, I'm, you know, I'm an old guy and uh, I, I believe in getting together and talking and face to face and that's meaningful to me. No, I, I think you're right. I, I used to, you know, my wife ran for public office this last election and, uh, and we had to do it all by Zoom and, uh, and face, uh, you know, FaceTiming. It was just, um, it missed all the hurly burly that I loved about politics where you kind of really have to get out and you have to go places that you wouldn't otherwise go in your regular life and, and where you can see how other people live. One of the great advantages of being politics is that you get to kind of have to live the lives through watching and learning everybody that you're trying to represent. Um, that, that's been lost. On the plus side, and I know you're a, a father and want to hear your view of this, but I, I never had to take as many trips in the last two years, obviously. And for me, that means I'm at home more uh, to read to my children and uh, that, for me, has been a real blessing uh, to, to, to get off that treadmill of life where every three days I was jumping on another plane. But tell us about your uh, family and how it is for you as a father. Well, it's been, I have to say, that was really the blessing of COVID that I got to. I'm very grateful that I actually got to keep working. But my hours changed dramatically. My travel changed to nothing and so I, I've gotten to wake up with my son every day for uh, almost two years and put him to bed every night. And that's time that you're never going to get back. And I think for me, especially as a single parent, I just, um, you know, I, I think that that bonding time that we had will wind up being of immeasurable importance uh, in the years to come, just as, as a single dad. And so I'm so grateful for it. I just, I just, it, it was such a wild uh, byproduct of this whole mess. Do you find as a parent now, how much you have drawn from your own experience uh, as a child, like modeling your own parents at all? I do. I definitely do. And I think that'll come into play more as he grows up where I insist, no, you need to get a job or you need to do something or you're going to camp. And this is why that's important. But um, I also think a big influence for me has been, I had, a, I had him at 50. And I think that having a child later in life, for me, it's been it's been so great because I feel I feel more comfortable in knowing who I am right. and in having a sense of what's important and what's not and what to get crazy about um, and what not to get concerned about. And, uh, you know, uh, so I think that it's caused me to be more laid back as a parent. And I think that there's great value in that. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Obviously, I didn't get married till I was 43. I've got five kids now and the youngest three I just dropped off. But he was because we have full day pre-K now. And of course, we're hoping uh, if uh, the bill back better goes through that more families across the country will will have uh, pre-K. Um, in any event, let me just uh, say, I think you're absolutely right. setting that foundation and understanding how formative that foundation is. Because I believe a lot of mental health issues down the line come from that um, insecurity that children have when they're not given those bright lines of kind of responsibility and um, you know, the guidance they get from parents. Yeah. Um, it's it's great to hear that. I, I too think that I've obviously I'm in a different place in life. I can focus on them in a way that I might have not been able to as a younger person. But I find I am taking kind of the best of my parents. My dad was uh, as much as he was fractured from trauma of 
watching his brothers killed and experiencing a lot of trauma in his life. One thing he really got right with me is that he was very physical, very loving physically. We, he'd hold me all the time. We'd kiss each other on the cheeks. We, we, and I just naturally do that. And I'm so grateful that I had that modeled for me. Mm. Um, I don't know what your experience is on that front, but um, my dad wasn't good at talking about mental health. In fact, he, you know, he, he, he wanted to shut it down. When I was doing the mental health parody bill, he was like, do you have to talk about it so much? And um, until I went to the bookstore and I read all the family secrets that I thought were still secret, I didn't realize that I was, you know, a prisoner to this cultural phenomena that he grew up with. And that is you can't talk about these things. So um, yeah, I'm happy for my kids, as I'm sure you'll be for, for your child that um, they're going to grow up in a world where it's okay to talk about this. Um, yeah. And, uh, and so I, I think that also, we're also aware of neurodevelopment, right? So we know the kids, if they have that modeling can really develop those skills and coping mechanisms and uh, that, that can help them grow and manage stress. I don't know about you, but growing up, I didn't have the best toolkit for managing stress. I, I turned to drugs and alcohol at an early age, and it was hard for me to break free from that. But um, but I do think that that's going to be important for our ne next generation to know how to talk about when they need help, know how to navigate uh, their emotions and their thoughts. I mean, it's foreign to me that you could ever interrupt a thought before it becomes an action <laughs> that, mm. like that's foreign to me other than in being in recovery i would not know that i had the choice if i felt a certain way not to act on that feeling mm -hmm. uh, but I, I i think the mental health world that we're moving into gives people much more agency and autonomy over their own lives by giving them the ability to push the pause button as we say in recovery um so that all of that past uh, default mode doesn't play itself out uh, mm -hmm. as it's doing nationally with our politics being so, you know, uh, traumatic and, and, um, and needless to say, all the people who are um, stuck in this cycle of, of recrimination and blaming others for their problems. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, talk a little bit about um, how you see you know, as you, you watch this cultural shift, what you think people are, are really looking for in terms of the messaging um, from our kind of cultural icons, so they, they do follow them and record numbers on their social media. So, but I don't I suppose any of them get a, a rule book on how to be responsible <laughs> social right. media um, influencers, but, but that's changing a little bit too, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that people respond to real life situations these days. So it's not necessarily, um, God, I'm trying to think of an example of a, per you know, it's not necessarily if Jennifer Lopez posted a, a video of herself on Instagram talking about how we need to respect each other or whatever. I think it's more of an example of if someone saw something happen to Jennifer Lopez, that they could relate to if she was, you know, she's a bad example. I'm just, uh, you know, if someone, if, if Lizzo was uh, body shamed and you saw her speaking about it from her heart, I think that is, is something that, you know, causes people to connect uh, into a real life situation and maybe make them think about how they have treated people or the words they've used. So I just think there are a lot more examples in pop culture. And, and I think in terms of a lot of the shows on Bravo, you see people behaving badly, but then you see what the result of that is or how you, know, you see a cause and effect. And I think that is something that people relate to and it, you know, a lot of times people love judging human behavior and I've made a living 
off of judging human behavior and people who love judging human behavior. And I think that's one of the reasons people keep coming to watch the Real Housewives on Bravo. It's like, oh my God, but I can't believe she said that. Is she gonna get away with that? Or how's the other person gonna respond to that? And I think weirdly it's this kind of sociological tornado that's happening where you can see cause and effect and you can have opinions about it and you can it can generate dialogues. So it's not all, um, and some of it is just entertaining and banal noise. And some of it actually, I think, um, uh, motivates conversation about behavior and stereotypes and um, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I'm interested in latching on to because uh, it helps me kind of change with the times and move the dialogue along as well. Well, I have to say, um, you do a terrific job with great equanimity navigating those conversations. Right. And it gives you a sense of reprieve from the kind of toxic kind of combat that often happens with your guests. And you just have a nice manner and it kind of gives us a chance to take a deep breath and say, oh, we don't have to jump into that ourselves. Um, you know, because you can still have a great connection with all of their participants without having to jump into the fire uh, of the conversation. And, and that I think is a good model for all of us because you know, it is, we're all living in that world of <laughs> reactivity to everyone around us and pointing fingers and yelling and screaming and this and that. It, it, it's almost helpful when you see that to stop, step back and say, where do I do that, mm -hmm. right? Where have I lost that pause button or the ability to step back and see myself for how I come across? I yeah. can tell you that's never been something I've always had. Uh, other than having uh, in recovery a better appreciation for um, where I am and w how I am. Uh, a lot of that when I w watch uh, many of your guests, uh, I'm not sure how much insight they have to, to how things are, are rolling in their heads. And, um, and I think that's important. I think people can, can learn. I, I mean, how do I uh, if you will, as I said, push the pause button on, on that reactivity in, in the brain, because, you know, some of your guests say it's like their amygdalas are just yeah. on fire and, and they can't use their prefrontal cortex to push the pause button. They can't. And so hopefully it, hopefully then the people that are watching someone with absolutely no filter and absolutely no ability of what they're, you know, of, of how to navigate, you know, societal norms, Hopefully then it can cause the multitude of people watching to say, this is not acceptable. This is not how we, you know, I mean, hopefully it will have that effect and not an emulation. I think that's the, you know, the Real Housewives got blamed for um, some of what people connected to about Donald Trump. And I, it bothered me greatly because I was like, I would hate to think that this is, you know, in my mind, this is a, um, this is a societal conversation about what's right and wrong and what's accepted and what's not and what you can get away with and what you're, what you can't. So that's where I am with it. 